Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm excited for my guest today. It's somebody that I have followed for a very long time and I feel like has helped me in my own health journey. So I've wanted him to come on the show for a while to share his expertise with you guys. His name is Dr. Daniel Pompa. Dr. Pompa is a respected leader in the health and wellness space, educating practitioners and the public on the origins of inflammation-driven disease, the therapeutic application of the ketogenic diet, fasting, ancestral-based health approaches, cellular healing, and detoxification. Although trained as a chiropractor, his authority is rooted in his own battle, having overcome neurotoxic illness and heavy metal poisoning using his own unique cellular detoxification strategies. You can find Dr. Pompa at drpompa.com and on the weekly Cellular Healing TV podcast and Health Hunters radio show. So welcome, Dr. Daniel Pompa. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited to have you here because when you get diagnosed with uh, heavy metal toxicity, it's like, I, I remember like resisting getting into the whole heavy metal world because it was so like, oh, I don't even want to go there. So it was an area that I just hadn't explored yet. And then I discover I've got heavy metal toxicity. And then you go crazy trying to find people that actually know what they're talking about aren't going to put more harm into your system because heavy metals is a pretty serious thing. And there's so many, so much wrong information out there about how to get rid of it. And you are just like the leading guy when it comes to heavy metal detoxification. So thank you for all the information that you've got, got out there. Uh, I would love for you just to tell your story about how you discovered, like what was happening to your health when you discovered you had um, mercury toxicity. Yeah, you know, it's like I wish I were just diagnosed with, you know, heavy metal toxicity or heavy metal poisoning. Yeah, it didn't work that way. I was probably better diagnosed as I think you're just crazy. So right. yeah. <laughs> I think you're losing your mind. I, yeah, like I had been to every, you know, possible type of doctor. I mean yeah. I, I did everything. I was trying to figure out what was wrong. I mean, I had an unexplainable illness, which uh, the diagnosis ends up just to be it's all in your head. But um, it took me some years, unfortunately, to figure out what was going on. So it wasn't like I landed on it right away. Uh, but everything I teach now to doctors all around the world is what I learned in that battle. So yeah. it came out of it. Pain to purpose is, is my story. But I, you know, I like so many people listening and watching. It, it's, it started with fatigue. I, you know, what I didn't realize is all of it started after I got two silver fillings removed. Mm. I just never correlated that I, I at that time I thought it was just the anesthesia the process and I was cycling at the, the expert level at that time and I was putting a lot of miles in so then I just thought I was uh, overtraining cut back then it went to headaches then it went to you know it, allergic to everything I was eating in my world I, I would eat bloat and all these things and I was playing the game of you know food intolerance chasing foods and then it went to mm -hmm. panic attacks anxiety sleep problems insomnia I mean you know, you name it. Then it just went to the bizarre things like sound sensitive, adrenals were fried, my thyroid went. <laughs> so it was, I spent a lot of time downstream trying to fix my adrenals and trying to fix my thyroid and my gut. And, you know, then it was, I had um, found Matt Hatter's disease online and that's uh, people making felt hats for using mercury. They became mercury poison. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have every one of these symptoms. So I got a, did a blood test, it was negative. That was very disappointing. Uh, by this time, I'm thousands and thousands into debt. I mean, my wife and I literally estimated around $180,000 is probably wow. what we spent in my journey, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and we didn't have it, I, we were remortgaging homes for goodness sakes. But the bottom line was it was probably another year after that disappointment. I read a book from a very bright endocrinologist and. I was, you know, kind of became friends with him in a sense that we would talk. And he said, you know, Dan, I think you have mercury poisoning. I'm like, I thought so too. You know, I did this test. It was negative. He's like, wrong test. If it's, you know, in your blood, that's a acute exposure. You were getting exposed every day because it's in and out of your blood in 48 hours. So I think it would be chronic. You need to challenge it out of your tissue and do a urine collection. So I did that test. And then metal showed up, right, along with, you know, some mercury, not high, because he explained to me that most of it's in your brain, and that's right. what's dysfunctioning your thyroid, your adrenals, it's up here, which 
actually I had figured out my pituitary, which runs your hormones, that's what was wrong. My pituitary hypothalamus was, you know, not correct. And I just couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. And then when I started researching um, amalgam illness, where the mercury vaporizes, crosses into the brain and goes into the pituitary hypothalamus, that was it. So then to your point, I went online and started looking yeah. at all the crazy world of heavy metal detox. Oh, all yeah, it's the crazy. contradictions. And, yes. you know, I, I was dyslexic as a child. And one of my gifts with being a dyslexic is I can read literature, remember uh, you know, where it is, what it is. And I put this together before I jumped in. And again, everything I learned through the process I teach today. So uh, pulling it out of the brain is the key. Doing it yeah. correctly is the magic. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I, I do believe you found the Andy Cutler protocol that kind of got you started correctly. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So Andy, uh, I always credit Andy for um, when I started looking at using real binders and chelate, mm -hmm. which, because most of what's out there is um, just weak binders, Corella, cilantro, they, you know, everything, uh, you know, those are weak binders. They, they don't make people with real mercury or heavy metal illness well. Uh, they make them worse. And so finding that, I realized, okay, you can use real binders. But, you know, I, I have it about it because I did a, a challenge with DM, DMPS. And then yeah. I also was trying to do glutathione and I would get worse. So then I realized, oh, you have to do it in the half-life. And I give Andy credit for that because he was the first to really identify using real chelators within their half-life. Meaning if it's DMSA, you have to take it every four hours. DMPS, you have to take it every eight hours. You have to do it for so many days. And, um, you know, Andy had spoken at uh, some of my seminars uh, early on. I really appreciated his research. Yeah. I also credit Andy for using alpha lipoic acid to remove inorganic mercury out of the brain. Now, what I did around that was it, it was, I realized doing that, okay, was, there's so much more here, you know, yeah. because people doing that would feel somewhat better, but they wouldn't get their life back. And that's what I, my five R's of how to upregulate the cell function of what detox really is. So my work of cellular detox really combined to using these chelators correctly is you know, where it became the magic of what I teach today. So real mm -hmm. detox has to be at the cellular level. You mm -hmm. have to use real chelators correctly to Andy's uh, teachings, you know, putting that all together. And with other binders, I learned to use a binder in the gut so you don't auto-intoxicate. I learned to use other binders, not just one in and around the cell. But if you don't upregulate the cell's detox pathways, you won't ever get your life back. So my saying is you have to fix the cell to get well. And my five R's became that roadmap of what I teach doctors. Can you just briefly tell us what the five R's are and just kind of, for, for those that don't understand what cellular detox means, no. right? Yeah. So my five R's is, you know, real detox. I always say there's three components, upregulating the cell function. That's the five R's. I'll explain it and then using real binders and chelators to make sure the metals go all the way out of the body or whatever toxin, because it could be a biotoxin from mold or infections. And then um, also opening up the downstream pathways correctly, right? So those three components must be there to have real detox, which very few, if at all, put it all together. I mean, that's why my passion is teaching doctors this. But the five R's, the key to real detox is getting the cell to do what it does every day, even when you make energy, so you feel good, ATP, you can, your brain works, your digestion works, you make a waste that the cell has to get rid of. Once these pathways shut, shut down, like it happened to me, now you're not even getting rid of the toxins your body creates when it makes energy. You're dead in the water, you start turning on all your bad genes, you just, it doesn't matter what you do down here. If you use DMSA correctly, and you know colon cleanses, liver cleanses, saunas, doesn't matter. You have to get this fixed. So our number one is removing the sources from your life, meaning that if I didn't get rid of the fillings, the silver fillings that contain 50% of mercury, there's no way I'm going to get better. If you live in a moldy home and you're, you know, you're trying to detox and get well, forget it. It's a, it's a nasty biotoxin that's too powerful to overcome. Or hidden infections, these where you had wisdom teeth out, they form cavitations or root canals. These are hidden infections, crush your immune system. So you have to evaluate these hidden sources of toxins and remove them. That's our one. 
R2 is you have to regenerate the cell membranes. Every cell has these precious membranes that determine how your cell gets rid of things and even absorbs good things, how good things come in, bad things come out. The key to real detox is the cell membrane. I teach whole classes on that and nobody gets that, except scientists seem to get that. <laughs> but when you come into the practice world of detox, everyone just thinks it's about the sauna, it's about the colon cleanse. It's like all these old things that really aren't real detox, they're just out there and they just don't go away. You know, it's like bad government, it just stays. You know? It's like low fat, it's like yes. you know, these things <laughs> just stay in society. Uh, low calories, they just don't go away. Yeah, no, they uh, don't. Yeah, that's the way it is even in alternative medicine or detox. These things just don't go away, I'm constantly battling them. But anyway, so we have to regenerate the cell membrane. R3 is you have to upregulate the cell energy. I mean, nothing works in the detox of the detoxification uh, pathways without enough cellular energy. We have to upregulate that. As a matter of fact, glutathione is one of the things the cell uses, just one, there's others, to get rid of toxins from the cell. Is there's something called the Gibbs free energy equation. As cell energy drops, glutathione drops. So now you're, you have no ability to detox the cell and inflammation increases which brings me to R4, which is you have to downregulate the inflammation of the cell. Yeah. Well, you're not gonna do it without fixing the membrane. You're not gonna do it without upregulating uh, the cellular ATP. And you have to do, we're gonna probably talk about this, but a lot of my dietary, dietary yeah. issues, feast famine cycles really plays a role there. Then the last R is reestablishing something called methylation. It's kind of in vogue right now. What gene mm -hmm. do you have? The MTA, mm -hmm. the yeah. whole other topic because I'm not a believer. Uh, you know, we just discovered, by the way, a new gene. Oh, if you have this gene, then this one isn't apl you know, applicable to you anymore. Oh my gosh, you know how many <laughs> genes we're going to discover in the next five to 10 yeah. years. We go, oh yeah, we didn't realize if you had this gene and this gene, MTHF or homo like I said, it didn't matter. You know, no. so a lot. But anyways. It's all news now. Yeah, yeah. So reestablishing methylation is critical for detoxing the cell. It parallels glutathione, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is those five R's mm -hmm. have to be upregulated to upregulate the cell's function. That's real detox. And this is via supplementation and dietary. All of it together. Yeah, all of it together. Right now, all of it is what I teach my doctors. I, I call it, well, it, it's been known as the pop-up protocol, pop-up program, but it's a multi-therapeutic approach. Yep. And that is meaning using these feast famine cycles, fasting strategies, along with the detoxification strategies, all done together. And then there's the magic. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pamba, how many people do you think out there in the world are heavy metal toxic? Like, is this something that majority of people are now having, even if they don't have, like, I don't have mercury feelings. I had mercury. Yeah. You well, know, well, if we start here, first of all, I, did your mother have the fillings? Yes. Okay. See, because the number one exposure with lead and mercury is actually mom. Yeah. In utero, there's a study called the Drash study. When they looked at the number of fillings in mom's mouth, and this is done on autopsies of babies, right? Who didn't make it, unfortunately. But it was proportional from mom's number of fillings to how much mercury they found in the baby's brain. Remember, it's not body burden of mercury that matters. It's what's stored here. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's why when people do these colon cleanse of this then and you know you have to get it out of here that's how i got my life back so that starts in utero uh, number one source of lead is mom it's nor you store lead through your accumulation in the bones and then it's normal during pregnancy to lose bone but out comes the lead so it goes into the in baby in utero and then of course we start accumulating with vaccines and flu shots and of course, there's, you know, still mercury in our environment. Of course, it's loaded up in fish. And of course, you know, say we have so many other exposures. Con I wore contact lenses in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. Mercury was in the saline solution, another huge source. So again, the, to answer your question, you know, it, it's unavoidable. I mean, yes, it's just yeah, a matter yeah. of how genetically, you know, of course, genetics plays some role in the sense that, you know, we have way complicated detox pathways. How big is your bucket? How full does it become? As soon as that bucket overflows, we start developing symptoms. So we have to empty the bucket. That's where cellular detox comes in. Mm -hmm. I, I personally thought, oh, I don't have heavy metal toxicity. I've got no mercury fillings. I looked at the list of like symptoms. I'm like, yeah, I've got this, I've got that. But you know, most of them I don't have. 
but I'll just rule this out. And it ended up, I had some mercury, not that much. It was a aggravated test too, but my lid went to the top. Like it, it, it was off the charts. And then, yeah. and that's how I found you because your wife yeah. had yeah. super lead high lead. Yeah. Which, by the way, my children did. So they after did, I realized okay. my kids were like, after you know, raising them, they have all these gut disorders as little ones, right? Even as babies, constipation, diarrhea, ended up testing their lead off the chart. Where did they get it? Their mother who had hormone challenges. Where did she get it? Her mother. Okay, so, but lead is easily challenged on a test with something like DMSA. Mm -hmm. You know, it's water soluble, goes through the kidneys, we measure it in the urine. Mercury, I always tell people, rarely do we see it on any test. So the only accurate way to test for mercury is biopsy the brain. We're not going to do that. So I don't, there's really no accurate way to assess mercury. I, we've done them all, I and mean, we've done every test out there. We still do the challenge test because looking at body burden can give us an idea of someone's shutting down their pathways to heavy metals and, you know, and then look at their history and go, okay, we know there's mercury in the brain. You know, but that's the problem is that it's locked here and you can't test for it. So mm -hmm. to your point is you can't just look at your test and go, oh, I don't have mercury. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the hair analysis test where people can, like look at the minerals and stuff like that? I don't I understand it, but is yeah. there any validity to that where they say, well, you have no mercury, but you've got derangement in these minerals, which screams mercury. I think there's some validity to it. Andy mm -hmm. taught that in my seminar mm -hmm. and we were doing that method. You know, my doctors hated it uh, for two reasons. It, it was very convoluted to learn, right? You're looking at different minerals. The patients never got it. They never no. looked at it. You know, when you do a challenge test and you see lead, you go, okay, I got a problem. Yeah, <laughs> and someone tries to explain, well, you have this mineral, that mineral, that, you know. So it really, it didn't stick in my uh, doctor group um, doing that type of testing just because no one understood it. You know, and there's so many other factors that affect those things that you have to take those into consideration too. So mm -hmm. there's no perfect test. Mm -hmm. I work with, you know, most of my listeners are struggling with weight. They're struggling with weight loss resistance, which is my niche. So that's why they're following me. Uh, and I really think that heavy metals has a lot to do with it more so than we think with our hormones, like you talked about and with weight loss resistance. So can you explain how heavy metals could affect, like if a woman's kind of tried it all, she's done the yeah. hormones, she's done the, what she thinks is right, keto, fasting, and she's got maybe symptoms or she's got amalgam fillings. Yeah. What are, what, how could a woman tell if this is maybe a problem? Well, you know, most weight loss resistance, the inability to become an efficient fat burner, metabolically flexible, as we mm -hmm. call it, uh, hormone challenges in general. Most weight loss resistance is hormone related. Okay, yes. So let's start yeah. that. Yeah. Most people, women especially, but this applies to men too, that are struggling with weight loss or even sticking to a diet, but let's say that um, you do stick to your diet and still not losing weight. Okay, you might lose weight because you could lose muscle and there's a reason for that, but not fat where you don't want it, right? Whether it's the belly, the legs, the butt. Well, that's all hormones. So then the next question is, is okay, so what's disrupting the hormones that would cause me to burn fat as my energy source? Now we have to go to the cell. I dropped my black pen, I, I just have to grab it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't just disappear, but this is the only pen that if I write, it doesn't disappear on me. Okay, so when I teach, I draw a lot of cells. Okay. On every cell are hormone receptors, okay? These receptors, I'll use one hormone that we know we need to burn fat and have normal energy and actually think clear and, oh, and not be constipated. <laughs> so it's a good one to use. Thyroid hormone, T3 hormone. It has to come in and bind to one of these antennas on the cell receptor. And then it gets its message in the cell. Specifically, it'll send a message to the mitochondria. And that's where we make this precious energy that I said is needed in detox, right? But when it makes this energy, it can either use fat as sugar to make it. Most Americans, well, most people now in civilized countries are stuck as fat bur or sugar burners with the hormonal inability to use fat to make this energy. All right, so I'm using this example as thyroid is one of the hormones that actually makes the ATP use fat when you're not eating, especially, right? Which leads then to no cravings. You have plenty of energy when you're not eating. You feel great when you're not eating. 
thyroid, and again, there's other hormones here that play, but I'm using this as an example. Toxins come in and they attach to the cell membrane. Why? Because it's made of fat. What happens is then it drives something known to all of us called inflammation. So the number one reason we have inflammation of the cell, which is known to be linked to all these different diseases, conditions, et cetera, is toxins. It creates the cellular inflammation, but look what's happened. It's blunted the hormone receptors. So now you can't hear your hormones, right? So what is the solution today that's very in vogue, giving people more hormones, especially in our world, bioidentical hormones. It's very in vogue because I think people feel better at first when they get on them. But the example is if you shout at your kids, they actually hear you in the beginning, just like your cells would hear the hormones. If these are blunted and I up the levels, I'm gonna hear a little better. But here's the thing, if you have kids, you know this, they stop hearing you the more you should. You find yourself shouting louder and louder and they stop hearing you more and more and more. Ineffective, long-term, same with giving hormones. And I would argue there's a time and a place. So I'm not making an argument against bioidentical hormones. I'm just saying this, this has to be fixed, right? So we're giving, and by the way, then you give the hormone, your blood level of hormones looks good. And, the, and you're going, but my hair's still thin. I'm not losing weight because the cell is inhering the hormone, which is driven by toxins. So back up. We started the conversation. Hot, you know, cellular detox is the key. You got to fix this to fix the hormones, to fix the weight loss resistance. And just one more place where this becomes a problem, T4 is the inactive form of thyroid hormone that has to convert to the active form that gets in the cell. Most of that conversion happens in the liver. When your liver becomes challenged and toxic, you don't make the conversion. The doctor's given you T4, Synthroid, whatever it is. Your blood work looks better, but it's not converting. Toxins can be a problem here. Toxins can be a problem here. And as I already mentioned, if I draw a human brain over here, good luck for me to do this, but I just did it. Okay, good. Okay, we, that's really bad. Okay, but... <laughs> That's all I wanted you to see is the brain. When these toxins, as I started this conversation, end up accumulating, and studies show, the pituitary hypothalamus, that's where most of them go. And guess what that controls? Your thyroid, your adrenals, and all of your hormones down here. When I was sick, I was down here trying to figure all this out. Mm -hmm. The problem was here. The control tower to your hormones is here. So toxins can get you here, they can get you here at the conversions and they can get you on the cell. So you wonder oh, wow. why so many people today have weight loss problems. They're looking in the wrong place. Oh, and by the way, you know what happens? If you are successful in getting your body to burn some fat and the weight loss stops, your cells release fat because they're stored. As I mentioned, the toxins are on the, in and around the cells. It releases the toxins. You end up with more hormone resistance driven by the toxins that recirculate and it stops you from losing weight again. So toxins are at the root of hormone dysregulation and why people can't lose weight. Mm -hmm. Well, when you were first telling your story, it was so funny because you're like, oh, I had food sensitivities I had, and then I had a thyroid problem and you're downstream trying to fix all these or upstream trying to fix all these downstream, trying to fix all these problems and all of those symptoms that you talked about this is what I hear from women every single day in my practice that they have all of these problems. And I always say, if you can't, if the gut problem, if you fix the gut problem and you still have other issues or the gut problem comes back or you get more yeah. food sensitivities, you need to go up. You need to figure out what the heck then is farther at the root of the problem. Yes. yes. You yeah. know, it's in vogue right now. Um, hormones, as we mentioned, is in vogue. People try to fix it there. Um, but also fixing the gut, right? It's like it's everywhere. But I'm going, gosh, you know, I deal with thousands of people because I train doctors. You can't fix the gut unless you realize what's going on upstream. A great analogy of that is think of a river, right? You are trying to, all the fish are dying. You know, you just have this beautiful home on the river and you're wondering why all your fish are dying, even the algaes are dying, you know, the, the plants. And you repopulate your, you know, with all the fish. You spend all this money, they bring in new fish, and the guy's even smart enough to put new uh, microorganisms in, you know. So they do all this to fix that little ecosystem, and then it dies again. And you do it again, 
and it dies again. Only to find out that 20 miles up the river is a factory dumping mercury or lead into the river. And that's why all the microorganisms are dying and therefore your fish and therefore the algaes. So the point is, is you can't fix a gut just by trying to put more bacteria in it when there's a factory upstream. Could be the mercury in your brain, could be the silver fillings, could be lead pouring out of your bone, whatever it is. You know, it could be a hidden infection from where you had a tooth pulled 25 years ago. But if these upstream sources aren't found, good luck fixing your gut, good luck balancing your brain, good luck balancing your hormones. Yeah. And there's the rare case, I'll, I'll give it that, that I've had, I have had lots of people that it's like, here, get on some desiccated thyroid. And it's like, they flourish, they drop all the weight, they feel amazing. That's all they ever need for the rest of their life to feel great. And I, good on you. But if it keeps coming back, you keep having problems. I've had to learn this the hard way, just like you did, where it was like, oh, I'll just take some thyroid hormone, or I'll just go take this hormone or this supplement. And no, it comes back, comes yeah, back. But, but let, you know, even that example, though, the thyroid's the canary in the coal mine. And if you know what that was, is that yep. back in the old days, before they could sense bad gases in mines, they'd literally have a canary there. Canary, the canary sure. would die before the humans because they the gas, they were so sensitive, right? And then they knew to get out. They had a certain amount of time to get out. Our thyroid is that, right? It's so sensitive. It mm -hmm. goes foul before the rest of us. So just by, you know, by giving some desiccated thyroid as your example can actually make people really, really better, right? But the problem is this, that was a sign that your bucket, stress bucket, I like to say, was very full and your thyroid was the first to feel that. And that's very common, by the way. Yes, it is. If you, yeah. When I talk and I still have clients that I help from all over the world, I just coach people virtually now with these complicated uh, autoimmune, different things. I mean, you know, just coach them what I teach my doctors, basically. What I find, though, is that it typically starts with that thyroid connection. And they always have a time where they did something that made them feel bad. I mean, even taking a, a hormone, as I pointed out, actually goes, I'm better now. And that can happen. They can be better for like five or 10 years, just because it, in the, there might have even been an emotional thing that was taken out of their life, right? Which mm -hmm. will empty their bucket. Remember, this is a stress bucket, okay? So if I write that here, stress <laughs> bucket, meaning that every bit of stress fills it. Remember, it starts in utero, you know, and we start accumulating, and we start accumulating. Emotional stress fills it, chemical stress, physical stress, until one day it overflows, okay? And then basically we start symptom treating, and, but ultimately we have to empty the bucket. But our thyroid is an indicator that this bucket is full. It reacts to emotional stress, physical stress, or chemical stress. So you might have even unknowingly released an emotional stress, you know, this and that, took the desiccated thyroid, helped the physical stress, and you're functioning better. But caution, most of those people fall, that bucket ends up overflowing. And what happens, I call it a perfect storm. Three stressors come together, physical, chemical, or emotional, or two chemical, one emotional. So you could have a mold exposure. Uh, an emotional stress. Pregnancy. Fillings. Pregnancy. Pregnancy That's was a physical the and yep. emotional and the chemical stress yes. because during pregnancy, lead comes out of the bone. Yep. So the pr pregnancy alone can be that perfect storm of stressors. And then, boom, it's triggered. And then the genes triggered. And, you know, and meanwhile, all you did is like, gosh, I should have, instead of just taking the thyroid mat or the desiccated thyroid, I should have dug deeper. The thyroid's the canary in the coal mine. So, caution. Yes. Love that. Thank you. Yeah. I, I feel just as passionate about that as you do. <laughs> I think it's great. And I, everyone's got to hear that and they've got to understand that you do have to dig deeper, that there's usually more to it that, and you can't just band-aid these things, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And talking about stress too, I find in my, what I've noticed the last couple of years, and I think that you're going to start to see more of this is the whole, we have to, you know, de-stress our life. And I understand that. And I think that's, that's true. We have a lot of outside stress coming at us, but when you see a lot of low cortisol, adrenal insufficiency, that that is actually, now I'm starting to look towards, you know, why is your body downregulating cortisol? There's a reason, and it's usually infection, heavy metals, yeah. something else, and it's not so much the stress in that person's life, that I'm sure adds to it, but it's so important now when I see adrenal insufficiency on hormone testing to go, dig deeper now and look at the 
Absolutely. Heavy metal toxicity. It's just, you know, it's just responding, right? And, yeah. you know, by the way, uh, you know, we're all under stress, right? I mean, some people are much greater than others, no doubt. But really, it is our perception of the stress and how yes. we handle it. So, again, when our buckets aren't right at the edge, it takes a lot more even emotional stress to shake our adrenals and our thyroid and our hormones. But, uh, you know, let's do it two ways right here. If I had two glasses, one filled to the top and one halfway. Okay, the halfway one, I can stress it pretty good and I don't get spillage symptoms. This one, a little bit of stress and I get spillage. Okay, so are you the person that's all filled up with stress? And remember, physical, chemical, and emotional. I may not be able to help you with your emotional stress, but if we get the chemical stresses down at the cellular level, now you can take a little more stress. That was yep. me. I mean, yeah. I couldn't even be in function. One sniff of perfume. And I was oh, like, yeah, I couldn't yeah. even sleep, right? It's yeah. like, so, you know, I had to empty that bucket, physical, chemical, and emotional, but you can only address what you can control. You know, mm -hmm. you can't look back, you know, it takes a lot longer to deal with trapped emotions and those things. And I'm not telling you not to address them, please do. But what can you address right now, right here? And that's the chemical exposures. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to hop into weight and diet and stuff like that. Now, for my first question would be, being part of all these heavy metal forums and, and going through this on my own journey, it's very common. And I think it seems to be just women that gain weight when they detox heavy metals and for a period of time. And then they start to lose. Have you, do you see that in your practice? Oh, there, there is that because. <laughs> yes. Tell me and why. I, I Nobody seems learned, to know. <laughs> I've learned tricks to like help avoid that, right? Using, you know, more binders, different places. But it's for that reason I said, when you start uh, burning fat, right, you start to release more toxins that the body can actually get rid of. And then they redistribute on some of the cells. And remember, if they redistribute on the cells, they're affecting the hormone receptors. And then it'll cause weight, the weight loss to stop. So that, that's the key is you need more binders, more detox uh, cycles with, you know, oftentimes, uh, gosh, without you know, we don't have the time for me to go into my whole process. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but, you know, okay, so we start off regulating the cell function. The cells now start to release toxins. We use a product called Cytodetox. is a vehicle that removes the toxins from the cell all the way out of the body. So you don't redistribute it and cause more hormone dysregulation. It has some particles that go in the cell and the membranes, and it has some bigger particles that stay out to prevent redistribution. Now, some people are releasing so many toxins because they're losing weight so quickly that we have to add other binders. Um, DMSA is an, a, a water soluble. Sometimes by adding DMSA um, extra on top of the cyto is what they need to prevent that. Uh, we use a gut binder because these toxins will make their way to the liver. They bind up with bile, which your body uses to digest fat, but it's made in the liver. The toxic complex is formed in the liver. Then when you eat fat, it releases the bile in your gut. Here's the problem. Your body's designed to reabsorb the bile back to the liver. So it pulls the toxins right back through. And then you're auto-intoxicating, which stops weight loss. So we've used to use binders and sometimes more binders. And some people need them on the off cycle. What does that mean? <laughs> we, when we detox, we do certain days on, we take a break. Certain days on, take a break. Some people need to stay on some of those binders through the off cycle, like the gut binder and to prevent that weight loss resistance. So using binders in the right place is, is part of what I teach, but it's different for everybody. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. What worked for Mary is not gonna work for Jane. Right, yeah. I find I had to go way down in my dosing in order to stop the weight gain, because I yeah. would gain weight every time yeah. I would do a round. So that's another was, strategy. We have to yeah. decrease what we're pulling out and increase some of the other types of binders that are pulling from the cell. Mm -hmm. I think this is important for everyone to hear because it's a very tricky business, heavy metal detoxification. And we're going to get to the, where you can get help from Dr. Pompa because there's a lot of doctors all over North America that can help all over the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've trained some people in Europe yeah. now too. That, yeah. you know, we're not doing seminars yet, but they're coming here. But you know, I'm trying to get this out there as best I can. Mm -hmm. So I love your theory around diet variation. And I really want you to talk about this because uh, about two years ago, I had been putting, you know, 
countless hundreds, if not thousands of women on ketogenic diets, the paleo diet, putting them through fast. Um, I've had this long going uh, membership going with ketogenic diets in it. And I started to find after a couple of years of doing this, all these women would plateau, like all, like almost across the board, like at least 90 to 95%, these women on these low carb fasting diets, they would do amazing in the beginning. And then all of them at some point would just come to the screaming halt and they could not lose weight. And they would all start fasting more, lowering their carb more. And you go into all these forums and you see all these complaints of this happening. And I started to just put everything I knew together. And I was like, that's it. I need to do a carb cycling, fasting. Like, I understood what was happening. I thought I was the only person in the world understanding this. And I started to completely change my take on fasting and keto diets and did start to implement the fast kind of feast cycle. And then I heard you on a podcast talking with Dr. Jay Davidson, whom I love. And I was like, he gets it. He gets what I get. And he's catching shit for it too on the low carb forums. Oh yeah. I, I, <laughs> I heard you say that. Yeah. You were like yeah. on the low carb cruise right. or something. And you were yeah. like, okay, everybody, you need to start eating carbs. <laughs> but, but it's a funny low carb USA. They, they haven't invited yeah. me back, right? And because <laughs> they were mad because I got Dr. Mercola on this too, right? Yes. And, and then Dr. Mercola came it, out. Yeah, yeah. After fat for fuel. Uh, you know, because of his own experience, you know, and he had uh, consulted me when we were at a seminar and, and I was like, look, this is what's going on. You know, it's yep. like, when, you know, just to keep it very simple. And I, I in my book, I, I talk deeply about this issue and how to break through it. Right. But, you know, diet variation is the magic. Every ancient culture on the planet never stayed in one diet ever. As a matter of fact, the moment they had carbs, typically they ate them, uh, you know, because it was survival. Right. Um, we are programmed for this dietary change and it really creates an adaptation which creates diversity in our microbiome it makes our hormones flourish so i don't camp in one place vegan yeah. keto paleo everyone you know they change their diet right and they go oh my gosh i feel so much better so now they're camped there yeah totally <laughs> yes Everyone's yes like, and they hold on for dear oh, life yeah, i'm yeah. like it stopped working for you six months ago why do you feel like exactly. you need to keep doing this <laughs> and, and the magic is not any of those diets it's moving in and out of them and, and by the way it's an easier lifestyle to stick to right so much easier up, right you don't go oh my god i'm failing on my diet now yeah if i stayed in a ketosis diet you know, it's forget it. No, forget I'd, it. You know, I'm an Italian who loves food and you know, go, I would go nuts, you know, and yet we have guilt when we don't. But meanwhile, the magic is high carb days, yeah. high carbs for five days a month, high carbs. It's like, really? Yes. That's what the science shows. And that's what we're genetically programmed to do, you know, but so it, it, in simplicity, you know, why this works after your low carb and very strict on the diet for a long time. The body cells can only use two things for energy. I think I pointed this out earlier, sugar or fat. So we force over to low carb. Now we're forcing ourselves to use most of its energy from fat, which in the beginning is wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you feel better, less inflammation. I mean, all these amazing things. And, and I love putting people into that state. I love ketosis for that state, Same. right? Yeah. <laughs> but when you stay there, the body goes, okay, wait a minute. I need this fuel because this is my only fuel now. So what does it do? It's not dumb. It, it's looking long-term for you, right? So it goes, I'm going to conserve it because I need it. So then what it does is it holds on to the fat. Oh, and it holds it in all the wrong places, by oh, the way, yeah. right? It yeah. was like, yeah. it, it was accumulating right in my belly where it's like, what's going on? So I would lower my carbs, you yes. know, 30 carbs a day, 10 carbs a day, no carbs a day. I'm getting fatter in my belly and losing muscle, getting weaker in the gym. What the heck is going on? And I'm doing research going, low carb diets cause insulin resistance. I'm like, wait a minute, low carb diets, how does it cause it? It does, but it doesn't do it from like how we gain insulin resistance from a disease standpoint. It's doing it to save your life. It's doing it purposely. So from the DNA in your cells, it sends a signal to those receptors on the, you know, right here. Remember I drew those, these little receptors, you know, it sends a signal from your DNA to those receptors and it says blunt to insulin. Insulin's a fat storing hormone. So what it does then is it starts storing your fat because it purposely blunted the receptor. So it's not insulin resistance except from the cells causing it, right? So it slows down fat burning 
but yet it still needs sugar. So it does two things. It can give you cravings or it can start breaking your muscle down and make glucose. It's called gluconeogenesis. So now it's holding on to its fat. It's very happy, but you're not because you're holding on to fat where you don't like and you're losing your muscle, which is lowering your metabolism. You're in a survival mode. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Oh, how do you beat it? Add carbs. And then all of a sudden, boom, the fuel. Bodybuilders learned it years ago. That's where I got the idea, yes. really. It was because you know they would, they would carb load and all of a sudden get vascular and more lean. Why? Because they were in this strict diet. And as soon as they broke it, the body said, let's burn fat now. It's cool. We're not going to die. You know, and, and the analogy I give, it's in my book, is like you know, if you're out in the wilderness in your cabin and you always store a certain amount of wood to make it through the winter to survive, right? This winter is harsh. It's bad. And you're burning through your wood really quickly. Your intelligence goes, uh-oh, I better start burning less wood or I'm not going to make it through the winter. So you start burning less and less wood. Now you're at 50 degrees in your cabin surviving. Just so happens a friend stops by. And goes, oh my gosh, I have so much wood, I'll bring some over. And he dumps you a whole new load of wood. Okay, that's the carb day, okay? And you go, oh my gosh, what are you going to do? You're going to start burning more wood, just like your body will burn more fat once it knows it has more fuel, right? And then the metabolic engine fires up, right? So, I mean, that's as simple as it gets. Now, it gets a little more complicated because how many carb days do you need a week is different for everybody. Um, feast, famine, cycling, I, I discuss in my book because – if we throw in days of famine where we don't eat or we eat very little or we just eat one meal, that challenges the mitochondria and it makes it burn fat and get more used to burning fat. But if you stay there, you end up in this survival mode. So we feast and we famine. So we need to feast, remind our bodies it's not starving. We need to famine to challenge the mitochondria and get used to burning fat when we're not eating. Feast, famine, and all the studies, and I quote them in my book works better than any one diet. So if you compare it to low fat, high fat, whatever it is, yeah. feast famine, and you can do it monthly, seasonally. And, you know, and, I, and again, I lay that out in my book with many examples. I know I'm really excited for your new book. Uh, I, I was telling Dr. Trump, I actually booked this with him before I even knew the new book was going to be out. It's out, but it's not in Canada yet. So where, when are we going to be able to get our hands on the book? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's uh, because we're, we're, I decided just to release it without a publisher at this point. So it, it's not on Amazon yet, but you can go to beyondfastingbook.com. So the name of the book's Beyond Fasting, um, but beyondfastingbook.com. But in Canada, you'll get uh, nailed with shipping. I would call my website people and have them perhaps just, you know, ship it to you directly. But so you could, if you go to my website, dr, like doctor, dr, and then p-o-m-p-a.com, um, you know, they could probably send you the book until we get it out there. So we're early on it. You're early, but yes. it's, it's a great book. Um, and everything that I teach, you know, is, is, is in there. there. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I, 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 I love that you're spreading the word about this. And I will say to all of my listeners, I have been, I have now put, hundreds of people on this diet variation type diet that he's talking about. And it works so well to beat the weight loss resistance, to beat the weight loss plateaus and don't stop, you know, fasting more going lower carb. Cause you're just going to, it's, you are hurting your metabolism by doing that. Like it's just going to, you're adding yeah. fuel to the fire. It's so, not you know, in, in the book, I, I have a strategy even um, there's a seven week program of how to add five days of fast fasting a few times a year in your life will transform mm -hmm. how you age, transform your metabolic rate, transform all that. But you don't just run a marathon, you, you train to it. So the seven week program is week one, becoming fat adapted. You know, week two is we start the process of some intermittent fasting. And then all of those diet variation strategies are laid out through the weeks. So it basically, you go into a fast. Now you don't have to do a pure water fast. You can do what we call a partial fast. And I lay that out in the book too, you can choose. But you know, this is what we're doing. When we get these very challenged people, we're, we're using these fasting strategies and diet variation strategies along with the uh, detox. And the two together is, is magic. It really is, hormonally. Especially. Hormonally and weight, weight, well, weight wise, it's, it's amazing. And for people that want to, that are interested in doing heavy metal chelation, where do they start? <laughs> I, you know, I think we said earlier, you know, it's so different for everybody. You know, I developed a program called True Cellular Detox and 
you know, it's a very simplified box program, but for people who are challenged in some way, you know, with any type of condition, you need a coach. That's why I'm training doctors, right? Yeah. I still take people on myself. I mean, if you go to my website, you'll see coaching services, you know, and that kind of leads you through that. But um, I still enjoy it. I do. And I do it just virtually, you know, like we're doing here. Um, I even do some groups where I take five or 10 on at a time, um, but I still do some individual. And then my doctors uh, that I've trained. But, uh, you know, if you're healthy enough and just want to be healthy, True Study Detox program, my doctors use that for those people. But if you have a challenge, it's different for everybody. The doses, the cycle lengths, as we yeah. said, you know, you do yeah. better with low dose. Some people would do better with higher dose. How many chelators, what chelators, all of that you need to learn. Here's the point I love to make is everybody does, in fact, need a coach, especially for the most important things of our life. And I would argue this is it. You know, this is one of them. So the point is, is that you don't need treated. You need taught a process. When I take someone on myself, I work with them for a year. My goal is to teach them what I teach my doctors. Therefore, they can do this process long enough to matter. You don't detox metals in three months. You don't. That's one of my pet peeves. I hate that message. I pulled it out of my brain consistently for four years. Yeah. I did. I mean, yeah. I did my brain part of my detox for two years consistently. Then I would just do more staggered cycles for another two years. I still do brain phases. The point is, is that if you don't learn it, you're not empowered. You need coached truly to learn this process, to change your own life and have that power. Yeah, agreed. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pamba. I'm excited for the book. I'm going to put all the links in the show notes for you guys so you can go and visit him more. I love his podcast, so definitely tune in if you want to learn more about this. He's got a great podcast. Yeah. Cellular Healing TV, right there. Cellular Healing TV. <laughs> is it actually on TV somewhere? I always wonder that. Like, is it, as far as like video somewhere, do you just do it on YouTube or? Uh, no, I mean, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think we do release them uh, on different social media platforms. Like, okay. If you, <laughs> if you go to my website and click on Cellular Healing TV, yeah, they're, they're like this, right? They're on Zoom and you can watch them right. or you can just listen to them as well. Okay, yeah. See, I've only ever listened, so I didn't know. I'm like, is there really a TV channel with Dr. Pompa yeah, on yeah, it? There really, is. <laughs> there really is. All right. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me.